So I will respond to what we said, because I think it's an important message. Um, if you want to be carbon negative, not carbon neutral. And Lee's exactly right. It's, if you're going to be carbon negative, you better start worrying about food and agriculture. That gives you a huge opportunity. The one drawback of biomass is it grows in an energy efficiency of 1%, like that switchgrass. Was that the 1% or 3% switchgrass, Lee, that the picture you had? One, yeah. And so I'm going to show you a 10%. And once you're at that high of growth rate in biomass, you can do some serious damage with carbon sequestration. And so um, I'm going to go quickly through some of this stuff. So this is important, I think, for our community to keep remembering. You don't want to make CO2 out of, you don't want to do anything with CO2 from water because and that's not how nature works. Nature uses the sun to do water splitting to oxygen and hydrogen. In the dark, it adds hydrogen to CO2. And the reason is, is thermodynamically, the water splitting is the energetically uphill reaction. That's why you need the sun. And then all the other reactions, John showed some, but almost every reaction you can think of to any type of carbon-based product is thermoneutral or downhill at RHE. And that's why nature does it in the dark. Now the advantage of splitting, the water splitting up from CO2 reduction is if you're a little electron and you want to do, you have to reduce CO2 and there's a bunch of protons around from water, I don't know about you, but as an electron I would go do the easier thing and reduce protons to hydrogen. And nature knew that, and that's why it separated it. So you see in a lot of CO2 schemes out of water, it's all about suppressing hydrogen. But nature took care of that by segregating, and so that's what we decided to do. This part you guys know. Um, I'll just say two things about Berry Junctions, because I think the world's now doing all Berry Junctions. This is a nice one, because now we can do it all by CVD, so it's just coatings on silicon. But if you're going to use hydrogen at one atmosphere, like I'm going to talk about now, this has huge cost benefits. If you're going to use hydrogen the way John was talking about, you better use PV plus electrolyzer. But without compression, which I don't want to do any compression in the application I'm going to show, this actually is a good thing to do. You save a lot of cost. And also, this is a good thing to do because you're separating. What makes a good semiconductor is that it's a physics machine. You just want one electron, one hole separation without defects. What makes a good catalyst is multi-electron with lots of defects. You break bonds and you make bonds. So this also is just like what I'm going to do with CO2 reduction. That separates function. You make a good semiconducting material, and what makes it a good semiconductor makes it a lousy catalyst, and what makes a good catalyst makes a lousy semiconductor, so you should never try combining it all in one material. And that's what this does. Now, we could hit 12.8%. That, that's actually something we did with Tonio, with single crystal silicon and a little more complicated device. I mean, I think Harry will speak uh, at water. Well, I think the field will, it will be somewhere between 15 and 20%. I don't know what Harry will say. But in these type of architectures, I think you can expect that in the coming not so distant future. Uh, you'll be doing this at 15 to 20 percent. And why that's important is this is the photosynthetic membrane. And once you can do, oops, once you can do this, and you can do it at pretty good efficiency, I get to unload all that biological stuff. Because all that in the photosynthetic membrane, which I'm now, this is PS1, that's PS2 in the BC complex in between, that's all in the membrane. You can get rid of it, because all that's there to do is to split water to oxygen and hydrogen. So if you can use things like berry junctions at 15 to 20% to make hydrogen, 
you're way ahead of the game in photosynthesis because this thing is not good at energy storage. So when it does the O2 hydrogen, it's not inefficient, but it's in making the O2 and hydrogen, it has to do a transmembrane potential. So it's not trying to store the energy in water splitting, it's using the energy to run lots of biological function, and it's just doing a little bit of water splitting down the end of the line to forward propagate later on for carbon CO2 reduction, which is at 1%. So photosynthesis is massively efficient. It's just not interested in storing a lot of energy. And so I can get rid of this, because we have this, but the problem is how do I get then to hydrogen? Basically, that's what this is doing. It's making NADPH. So how do I get there? So that's what we did is we took a, we took a microbe Ralstonia eutropha, and then using synthetic biology, we overexpress the membrane in hydrogenases, and hydrogenases are enzymes that take H2 to two protons and two electrons, and once I do that, I can couple to, I'm not showing you all the details, an NADPH reductase, and that means um, there, and that's biology. So the trick here is to do solar water splitting and then overexpress hydrogenases in a membrane, and that gives you a pathway to then feed hydrogen into a biological energy cycle. And so the important thing here is this bug, it only eats hydrogen. So people who want to do synthetic biology and feed it sugar, that's dumb for our field, right? Because sugar grows at 1% or less than 1%, so your energy, you're already limited. Here I'm limited by what's going on over here. So I've freed myself of that limitation and then this bug will die if it doesn't eat hydrogen. And it, eat hydro it eats hydrogen right straight from the uh, materials we use for the leaf. And so the bugs will grow and you can grow biomass. They literally eat hydrogen, I run this cycle and they basically run a fatty acid, or I can run a Calvin cycle, and they grow. Two goes to four, and four goes to eight, and so on, and you get an exponential growth curve. The other thing you can do from this is acetyl coenzyme A. You can put four genes in here, and so we put these four genes in, and that's a ketodialase, a transferase, a decarboxylase, a dehydrogenase, because that's the chemistry they do. So a ketodiolase breaks that bond and makes a CC bond. That's what that enzyme does. So that's why you put that gene in. CTF does a hydrolysis. I make the carboxylate. Then I decarboxylate, so I put ADC in. That's a decarboxylase enzyme. And then I do a hydrogenation. So this bug makes acetone. And then it gets hydrogenated to isopropanol. And then you can... In, in, Tom showed his cobalt phosphorus, or cobalt phosphide, when we first did this in 2016, that's the catalyst we actually used, was cobalt phosphide. I will tell you, it's not cobalt phosphide that's the active catalyst. We, we know the reason why I think so good at making hydrogen is you make a thin phosphate layer, and then the phosphate does proton absorption, and it manages all the proton coupled electron transfer. That's why that thing is so spectacular at making hydrogen. But the other reason why it's important is it doesn't poison the bug. And more importantly, this is the catalyst we published a few, like four years, three years ago. I think we only put this in the uh, supplementary information. We didn't make a big deal out of it. But um, the reason why we liked it is it doesn't make reactive oxygen species, superoxides. That will kill the bugs. So that's why we had it. In, go after this cobalt phosphide, you take cobalt metal and you infuse 6% phosphorus in it, that gives you the right amount of phosphate to manage the PCET at the surface to make hydrogen. And that makes no ROSs and the bugs live, so that's for HER. And then we use our cobalt phosphate catalyst at pH 7 because we have to be at pH 7 because bugs don't grow in concentrated acid or base. And that's what we use to make the oxygen to do water splitting. So that's what these bugs do. You go into an exponential, so you take, literally, you take a, a, like a fermenter, you just throw a little pinch of bugs in there, just a pinch. And then they start eating hydrogen, 
you, you turn on your, your PV system, they start eating hydrogen, you go into an exponential growth phase, and then you adjust the hydrogen to the KM and the metabolic rates of the synthetic biology. You just gotta tweak all that. And I can then go into what's called steady state. So there the bugs are growing exponentially. This is OD, so the way biologists measure concentration is they do light scattering. So this is an optical density at 600, and that's scattered white. So there they are, grow, grow, grow. And then we adjust hydrogen and we adjust the synthetic biology so that we can go steady state. Some bugs die, some live. We keep constant concentration of bugs. And then we take all the extra hydrogen and we send it down that pathway I showed you here, and you make a fuel. And so if the bugs just grow, we, just, we don't do that complicated synthetic biology. We just play the hydrogenase game and let them grow. And this is what, Lee, I was mentioning. This biomass grows from solar water splitting at 10.2% energy efficiency. So solar energy in to stored energy in biomass. It's 10.2. The alcohol is 7.2. That's isopropanol. But you guys know when you get a cut, you use rubbing alcohol, isopropanol, to kill the bug. So that actually is being limited, that 7.2, by the concentration of isopropanol in water where the bugs are tolerant. We then went to these things. This is isopentanol. We can hit, oh, so here's isopentanol. We can hit around 4.8% energy efficiency. We like isopentanol because that's water emissible so I can just pour the isopentanol off the water, and the bugs are fine with isopentanol. So this is, this is being limited by synthetic biology. That's being lim limited by death of the bug. And then here's an important one. This is gonna get to the land restoration. I could, instead of making a liquid fuel that the bug excretes, I could make a fuel and store it inside the bug. And the, the fuel we make is polyhydroxybutyrate. So you take H2 plus CO2 and you make a bioplastic, and that stays inside the bug. So then what does the bug need? I already showed you. H2 plus CO2 makes carbohydrate or any organic thing. That's just a hydrogen storage mechanism for biology. So I've stored hydrogen and polyhydroxybutyrate that the bug can then take the hydrogen and leave the carbon behind. So I basically give it an internal solar fuel source of, of food, or you can think of me using solar energy and I fatten up the bugs on polyhydroxybutyrate, which is their internal energy supply. Um, just, this is something we've done in the last few months, we haven't even published this. Um, depending on when we cut from this acetyl coenzyme A, I can let carbons just keep growing and then cut. That's called a diesterase. So we just did this because we wanted to get to gasoline and higher carbons, diesels. I think uh, that's something Karen was talking about. So if we put that gene in there, it's only one extra gene. So here's the bugs. They begin growing. Up here is dodecane. And then by day two, they're, they're making a C8 acid, CO2. We can either esterify that and make a diesel fuel or decarboxylate it and we make heptane. If we want to make gasoline or some higher chain carbon, we just go higher carbon and then you decarboxylate, you lose one carbon. But it gets collected here and then I can just pour that off. That's kind of nice. So you can get evens. This is the data I just showed you or that's what's in here. That's the C8, totally selective for C8 fuels. If I use this gene, if I, and, and then I use acetyl coenzyme A, I can get to C12s, but I can play a different game. I can put in propionate, and that gets me to propionyl coenzyme A, and that has three carbons. Then I can add two at a time, and I can get odds. So this is with propionate, that's with acetate, and I can get C11s and 13s, and those are diesel fuels. We haven't published this yet. Okay, that was warm up. We have PHB, that's what I want you to focus on. And everybody's been talking about nitrogen. So 
that's in the air. Now remember, these bugs, I don't do CO2 concentration. They have carbonic anhydrases, just like grasses. So they are doing their own CO2 concentration with carbonic anhydrase. We're just passing air through, and they're eating the CO2. You can do the same thing. The other thing in air is nitrogen. So what we do is we take a different bug. This is a different bacteria called the xanthobacteria. We play our hydrogenase game. And what we do is water splitting CO2, but not to a liquid fuel now. We do that polyhydroxybutyrate. So you put these three genes in there. So these three genes will make polyhydroxybutyrate. There is a picture of the xanthobacteria. That big white blob is bioplastic. It's PHB that we've fattened them up on with water splitting. Okay, using Berry Junction or the catalyst plus PV, whatever way you want to do it. Then, once I have that there, they never need to see sun or water for hydrogen ever again because I've stored hydrogen with CO2 here. I can then take the bug and put them in the ground. And now I basically have solar energized the bug by storing solar energy as a fuel inside the bug. It can draw on the PHB and then run a nitrogenase cycle. Those little things there are all nitrogenase enzyme sites. And I can grow solid biomass. The other thing I can do is put a small molecule block in the pathway and not let the nitrogen forward propagate to solid biomass, and I can make ammonia. So here are the bugs growing, growing just like before. And it's the red curve here is all solid biomass. Then if you want ammonia, I put the small molecule block. The bugs go steady state, and then I start making ammonia. You can do N15 nitrogen and prove all your nitrogen's coming from the air, because all my ammonia has N15. Because it's a nitrogenase cycle, I make hydrogen. I can measure turnover frequency. And I find out that these bugs are turning over 3.1 times 10 to the ninth per cell of nitrogen into either solid, bi in this case, solid biomass. That bug is fixing a lot of nitrogen, a lot. So I can put it in the ground. Richie loves this. I can grow really big radishes. So these bugs we literally just put in the ground. Here is fertile land. This is what these were grown from. Then we take that fertile land and put our bugs in the ground. They start pulling nitrogen out of the air and they run a direct fertilization cycle at the root of the plant. And I get increases of 300% in root and shoot mass yields. So this is a fertilizer. When it runs out of PHB, it's dead. You then got to put more bugs, just like a regular fertilizer. But this is a renewable organic fertilizer made from the sun. It's Harbor Bosch, but in your backyard. But here's even something more important. This is what Lee was talking about. We can take that soil and totally deplete it so you get no radishes. These radishes actually were grown from depleted soil. So total, basically, Dust Bowl 1933 Oklahoma soil. You put these bugs in the ground, and they will start fixing carbon and nitrogen. The carbon's already fixed. They'll start fixing nitrogen. You've got to give them a phosphate source. I'm going to show you where I get phosphate in a minute. And I can actually get this crop yield from totally depleted land. And that's what this came from. We already know, because I'm growing crops, I can, I can look at how much stuff I've added to the ground. I can then weigh how much crop I have. We're better than any organic fertilizer. So I'm calling this thing KM8. I made one other little tweak that I don't want to talk about for, that, for this one. Um, and we're, we're already, in terms of a cost, we're way better than organic fertilizers. But here's something remarkable. This is using. Harbor Bosch ammonia in a field with KM8. And we're like a factor of two and a half. We're almost cost competitive with Harbor Bosch, which is unbelievable. And it's actually better because most fertilizers, you're getting 50% runoff because it goes to ammonium. 
dissolves in water and runs off. We, I haven't, we haven't done enough field studies yet, but we're not, we have very little runoff. We have solid biomass nitrogen that's working with a micro population to do direct root fertilization. So this number is a worst case scenario. If you have to go to high nitrogen uses, we're almost competitive with Haber Bosch. This is like real cost targets. I buy, I take 250 pounds per nitrogen per acre per year and look at how I use ammonia versus these bugs. These are the real numbers that we've collected in the last month. So that's pretty neat, but there's something more special. Remember, I'm growing biomass at 10%. There's a kill switch, which you always want in nature. When the bug runs out of PHB, it dies. I leave that biomass in the ground. When it's drawing on the PHB, it's pulling out the hydrogen, it leaves activated organic carbon in the ground. We end up being minus 2.3% negative in carbon in the ground. And it's because of the high 10% growth rate. And if, this is just a thought experiment, but if you take arable earth and take out Harbor Bosch nitrogen, which, by the way, is already a big deal because I'm not using methane to get my hydrogen. So I'm getting a huge CO2 benefit there. But my bigger CO2 benefit is the 10 times growth rate of that biomass plus the PHB left in the ground. You can put one gigaton of carbon in the ground, sequester it. And we haven't even optimized this yet. I'm going to have Harry, show me five minutes. Give it to me. Okay, great. I have five minutes. Um, <laughs> nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, sulfur, biogenic elements, they're all in the air. If there's one thing that you need for crops and you and health that isn't in the air, and that's phosphorus. If you come way back here, oh, I have to come way back. Look at what I have here. We are able. The other benefit of what we've done here is we set up a cycle where this bug, that dark black circle, is polyphosphate, and that came from DUM. DUM is urine. So that's NASA's formulation for urine. So these bugs out of waste stream urine can fix phosphorus, the polyphosphate. So if I grow the bugs in conjunction with the waste stream, I can revitalize the soil with phosphorus, too. And that's what this shows. These are dead, and then I have no bugs, one, one unit of dead bugs, 10 units of dead bugs, no phosphorus. But then as I go one unit, 10 units, some metric we're using, you can see that you start fixing phosphorus out of waste stream urine. So this is a way to put carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus using the sun as your driver, your solar energizing the soil with biogenic elements. And you guys are talking about markets. This is just a conservative market right now for what Lee was talking about, land restoration. And that's a point as it stands now, a $0.8 trillion market. So this isn't going away. This is a huge market driver, and you can see a lot of it is in that part of the world. They have a circle for it, because they've depleted their soil due to rapid emerging populations. They've depleted their soil of nutrients, and so they're having this massive land restoration problem. And I, that's something Lee was talking about. But the advantage here is this is like supercharged biomass. You can think about it this way. And I can put carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus back into the soil. And so for making fuels, you're carbon neutral. Will you ever make fuels this way? This is why I didn't worry. No. You're going to keep digging them out of the ground. There's no way you're ever going to be cost competitive with digging crap out of the ground. You'll have to have carbon pricing and all the stuff Ernie talked about. But I can already tell you this fertilization thing, it's already cost competitive and even better than, nat than synthetic fertilizers because it's carbon negative, not even CO2 producing, and I can put phosphorus, carbon, and nitrogen in the ground. So this thing already has legs, and we have all the 
cost targets. We've done the analysis. It's easy. I know how much stuff goes in. I know how much crop. I can measure how much carbon I left in the ground by radioactive tracing. So we, this is really, I think, an intro, and I'm glad I follow Lee, because we tend to think as a carbon neutral world, but we can actually do some real damage to do carbon negative by taking food and land as our two main uh, targets. And then third is the carbon neutral, what we do for a business. So I'm totally in agreement with Lee on that, and I'll answer any questions you have.